Buenos días de nuevo. Es un honor para este rector representar en esta aula mana a un distinguido investigador como el que nos acompaña hoy en esta primera sesión de nuestro Forum Nobel 2013. El profesor Richard Roberts es actual eh, director científico del New England Biolabs, Ipsis, Massachusetts. Obtuvo su doctorado en 1969 en la Universidad de Sheffield, en el Reino Unido, y después de una corta estancia en la Universidad de Harvard, en 1972, se trasladó a Cold Spring Harbor eh, Laboratory, con el premio de 1969 y co-descubridor de la estructura de ADN, eh, eh, con, en, con el doctor eh, Watson llegando a ser su director trabajó por primera vez en el recién descubierto tipo 2 enzimas de restricción en 1972 y en los próximos años fueron descubiertos eh, más de 100 nuevos tipos de estos enzimas trabajó la clonación de los genes para varios sistemas eh, de RM y la continuación del estudio de estas enzimas han sido los temas centrales de su investigación. Su trabajo con el adenovirus 2 lo llevó al descubrimiento de los genes de división y empalme del ARN mensajero en 1967 y por estos trabajos recibió el Premio Nobel de Medicina, como decíamos, en el año 1993. La secuencia de los 35.937 nucleótidos del ácido desorribonicleico del genoma del adenovirus 2 fue terminado en el año 1985. Esto requirió el uso intensivo de métodos informáticos, tanto para el montaje de la secuencia como para su posterior análisis y muchos de los programas principales fueron desarrollados por su grupo. En la actualidad, le dedica especial atención al problema de la anotación funcional de genes que se encuentra en genomas de bacterias y arqueas recién secuenciado, con especial énfasis en las metiltransferasas del ADN. Finalmente, debo añadir un aspecto menos conocido del profesor Roberts, su lucha por temas de solidaridad y cooperación en busca de la paz. Fue relevante su implicación en el caso de las enfermeras búlgaras secuestradas por el régimen libio, liderando, eh, liderando a la comunidad científica que, presidió, per, perdón, que presionó fuertemente por su liberación en el año 2007, gracias al profesor Robes por su compromiso social y su liderazgo. Espero que la charla de hoy y la sesión con jóvenes doctores que esta tarde configuran la jornada de excelencia eh, son los grandes objetivos eh, con los que hemos diseñado esta sesión de trabajo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Robert, for staying here. Well, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me. I'm really very happy to be here. I, I hope this microphone, yes, it is, does seem to be working, good. What I want to do today is actually to tell you about some quite detailed research, but I hope that I can tell it in a way that even those who are non-expert in the field, like my colleague Shelley Glashow, will at least get a good understanding of what it is I'm, I'm talking about. And I wanted to do this because we stand on the brink of some really very exciting science. And it's a good example of how advances in one field can make a big advance in another field. In this particular case, the advance has come from a new technology. Almost every time we come up with a new way of looking at things, you start to discover new things that you really couldn't find before. And this is what's happened with a new sequencing technique that has come along in the last couple of years that has given us some insight into DNA sequences that previously were just not present and, and we didn't have available to us. Before I tell you about this advance, I'll give you a little bit of background so that you will get some idea of where we're coming from. Let's see if I can do this. Well, this doesn't seem to be very responsive here. <laughs> Every time. Yes, this is the... Oh, okay. I, I was told these were the ones. Okay, okay, that's good. So, let's go with this. So, 
I, what I'm going to talk about for the most part is, is DNA and, and things that are connected with DNA. And DNA has been around for a long time, was first um, purified by Misha back in 1869. Wasn't really shown to be terribly important biologically until 1928 um, when pneumococcal transformation was shown. And even then it was not clear whether it was the DNA or whether it were the proteins that were in this organism that was important. And it really wasn't until 1944 when McCarty, Avery, and McLeod showed that it was, in fact, DNA that contained the genetic material. And it's rather unfortunate, and, and I don't really know why these gentlemen never received the Nobel Prize, because this was an absolutely key observation. These were the first people to show that DNA contained the genetic material. And it was a quite unambiguous experiment. There was no question about it. But as is the case, there were people who were wedded to the idea that protein was important. And so they tried to make the argument, I mean, much the way politicians will argue against facts, that in fact it was protein that was important. But in fact, we know that it's DNA that's important. And their experiments were absolutely dominant on that point. Now at the time, DNA, as far as anybody knew, contained four basic units, A, C, G, and T. All of DNA was just A, C, G, and T. And then along came this man, Rollin Hotchkiss, who was analyzing DNA and using some slightly better techniques to come at it. And what he showed was that there was another base that was present. Instead of just A, C, G, and T, one of the bases, C, also existed in the form of 5-methyl cytosine. That is, it was just a regular cytosine with a methyl group attached to it. And this turns out to be tremendously important in something that we now call epigenetics, although we didn't know about that at the time. But I'll, I'll say a little more about that in a moment. Now, the next big discovery in DNA, of course, was the double helix. And this was important because it showed for the first time how the genetic material could be the genetic material, because it provided a very simple way of showing how you could take the information from the two strands of DNA, separate them, and then make two identical molecules. And so this was the big insight into DNA, and everybody got very excited about it, and it led to all of the consequences that we now, now, now know about for molecular biology. The, the field of molecular biology was really born shortly after this time. Now, I told you that Hotchkiss discovered that there was this additional base that was present, 5-methyl-C, and it wasn't at first clear how it arose. But in 1963, Jerry Hurwitz, who is still working, still very active at, uh, in Columbia University, he showed that there were enzymes, proteins, that were able to take a methyl group from a substrate we now know as S adenosylmethionine and could transfer that methyl group onto DNA. And these enzymes were the very first examples of enzymes that were able to modify DNA to put extra bases on. We now know that there are a lot of other enzymes, a lot of other DNA methyl transferases that can do the same thing. And in fact, most of what I'm going to be talking about today are the enzymes that do that and the consequences of the DNA being methylated. So I spent a good deal of my time over the course of the last, oh, 20 years or so studying DNA methyl transferases. And in order to give you some idea of why they're important and why I think they're important in particular, I, I've just put up a few interesting things here. So the first thing is that they're part of restriction modification systems. And for those of you who are not completely familiar with restriction modification systems, these are systems that are present in bacteria and in archaea and they are there to provide essentially an immune system for bacteria, or at least a part of the immune system 
for bacteria. And what happens is that they're very simple in concept. They have two components. They have an enzyme that will cut DNA at specific sequences, and they have the other, that's the restriction enzyme, and they have the other enzyme that is a DNA methyltransferase that methylates exactly that same sequence in the DNA. So if it's methylated, the restriction enzyme won't cut it, and so a bacterium that contains one of these systems is protected by the methyltransferase, but a, a bacteriophage that is coming and trying to infect that bacterial cell typically is not modified, and so it goes in and the restriction enzyme cuts it up into pieces and thereby destroys the bacteriophage going in. So the methyltransferase protects the host, protects the bacterial cell, and the restriction enzyme then cuts the DNA from any, any DNA that's coming in that is not modified. I've been interested in restriction enzymes ever since 1972 for a, a variety of reasons. They were the basis of the genetic engineering industry, the biotech industry. Um, they were the, the enzymes that all of a sudden made gene cloning possible and were very useful for manipulating DNA. But it's really only in the, the last few years that I've gotten very interested in the methyltransferases. They're also very good examples of enzymes that recognize specific sequences in DNA. Now, we know a lot about things called transcription factors, factors that bind DNA and will tell polymerases when to start making message, where genes begin and so on, that there are a lot of specific sequences in DNA. And these proteins that recognize them, we know something about them. We know some ways in which they will recognize DNA sequences. We don't know everything. But once you begin to have a handle, once you begin to know what proteins are recognizing and how they do the recognition, this means that we can now engineer them. We can now make different ones that will recognize different sequences. And this is really important if you want to start to think about making synthetic cells. Let's say we wanted to make a new bacterium from scratch. You have to know about all of the proteins that interact with DNA. And if they don't exist naturally, then you would have to make them and design them so that they will recognize DNA. And so understanding the rules by which proteins recognize specific DNA sequences is very important for a basic understanding of life. Several of the methyltransferases have been shown to have regulatory activity in bacteria. That is, when they methylate their target sequences, they can turn genes on or turn them off. There are a few examples of that, not very many, uh, but it's likely that there are many more that have not yet been discovered. And as you will see, um, there are many candidates that can be doing this. Let me tell you a little bit about epigenetics. So I told you that when these experiments, the pneumococcal experiments were done, and then later when McCarthy and McLeod and Avery did their experiments to show that DNA was the genetic material, what they did was to show that this basic ACGT containing material, the DNA, when it went from one cell into the other, it contained the blueprint for that organism. It contained all of the genes, all the genetic information that was there. And this is the basis for hereditary. This is the basis for knowing why offspring very often resemble their parents. However, we know that there are other phenomena that take place. So if you take two identical twins, they're almost identical, their DNA is almost identical, but it's not absolutely identical. It turns out in, in, in twins, in human twins, the DNA sequence is identical, but the methylation patterns, the, where the methyl groups have gone onto the DNA, this can be different. And that's because the methylation responds to environmental factors. This is one way in which the environment actually can influence the genome and can influence the way in which the genome is expressed. During development, 
after you first make an embryo, and as the embryo begins to grow, there are changes in methylation from one cell to another. And this can determine whether the cell is going to become a heart cell or a kidney cell or some other kind of cell. Many of these effects are modulated by DNA methylation. So you can see DNA methylation is actually quite important. And we know something about it in higher organisms. In man, we know something about it. But in lower organisms, we know almost nothing about it. And we don't know whether bacteria and archaea, these lower forms of life or other forms of life, I'm, I'm not sure they're really lower. I think in many ways they're often smarter than we are. But nevertheless, these alternative forms of life, we don't know if they also show epigenetic effects. My personal view is that they do and that it's very important and that when we discover the mechanisms by which they do it and the kinds of things they do, this is going to be a, a really big discovery. I, I, I personally believe that this is an area where there are some big discoveries to be made, and I'm hoping I'm going to be the one to make them. Because when, in 1993, I went to Stockholm to pick up my Nobel Prize, my wife and I and the family, we had a wonderful time. Uh, and my wife would love to go again. <laughs> so let's move on and see the other things. Um, one of the nice things about DNA methyltransferases is that the genes that encode them are very easy to find using bioinformatics. And, and the bulk of what I do today is I sit in front of a computer and I do bioinformatics. I use computer programs to analyze DNA and protein sequences and try to understand what is the information content that is in there. And one of the things I do is to look for DNA methyltransferase genes. And finally, they have a really interesting mode of action of DNA. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about how proteins bind to DNA, but in fact, most of them will just bind to DNA. The DNA remains double-stranded, and they do their binding, but not methyltransferases. Rather, what happens with methyltransferases if you see the purple and yellow lines here, this is a DNA molecule. All of this gray stuff is all the protein, is the DNA methyltransferase. But you can see that this yellow base here is actually the base in DNA, in this case a cytosine, that is going to be methylated. And what has happened is the protein is bound to the DNA and then swung the base right out of the helix and into a pocket in the enzyme. This was the first example that we ever found of this base flipping phenomenon. And in fact, we found it back in 1993, just a couple of months before I had to go to Stockholm to give my Nobel Prize speech. And in fact, this was what I talked about at the Nobel Prize ceremonies. So it's a, a very interesting phenomenon. We now know that there are many, many other enzymes that use this same mechanism in order to do chemistry on DNA, and some not even to do chemistry, but just as their normal mode of binding. So that's another reason why these things are interesting. So what I want to do now is switch a little bit and tell you about DNA sequencing and bioinformatics and, and what we can do to actually find DNA methyltransferase genes. If we look at the currently sequenced microbial genomes, things for which we have complete DNA sequences. There are about 4,700 bacteria, and there are about 180 archaea. Archaea are this form of life between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. They have some things, some aspects of their lifestyle that look like bacteria. Others look like eukaryotes. Now, among all of these, 4,544 of them have easily identifiable restriction modification systems. So that means they have a restriction enzyme gene, they have a, a DNA methyltransferase in them. And only 302 don't. And the ones that don't tend to be what we call endosymbionts. These are bacteria that live inside other cells, typically live inside eukaryotic cells. Um, organisms like rickettsia, 
organisms like Wolbachia. The, these are very small microbes, tiny organisms. They live completely within a eukaryotic cell. And for that reason, they're not subjected to the same kind of pressures from bacteriophages that regular bacteria are. You know, if you go into the human gut and look at all of the bacteria living inside you, you will discover that for every bacterial cell, there are probably 10 bacteriophages. We're, we're full of bacteriophages as well as bacteria. The same is true in the sea. Many, many bacteria living in the sea, 10 times as many bacteriophages. And so this is a big problem. The, the bacteria have to protect against that. So living out in the wild is tough, but living inside a eukaryotic cell is much easier. Just a little bit of background about restriction modification systems. They come in three basic flavors at the top, which are the ones I want to tell you about. Um, the one at the top, the first one, the type 1, actually has three separate genes. The key gene there is the S gene in yellow. It's called the specificity subunit. And it is responsible for recognizing DNA. And so this is the one we need to concentrate on if we want to understand how this particular class of restriction system recognizes its DNA. In order to methylate, they also need the M gene. And in fact, the S and the M gene products, these two together, will make an active methyl transferase that will modify DNA. Below that are the type 2 systems. These are the ones that are really common. These are the ones that I began um, discovering lots of back in 1972, 73, 74, following the pioneering work of Ham Smith and Werner Arber, who got the Nobel Prize for the original discovery of these systems. These are two separate genes. There is one gene that encodes a restriction enzyme, separate gene, a methylase. They operate completely independently of one another, and they both recognize the same sequence, but in totally different ways, very, very different kinds of interactions. And at the bottom, of the tower, in the third row, are the type 3 genes, and these have properties intermediate between the type 1 and the type 3. What I didn't tell you is that with the type 1 enzymes, while they recognize a specific sequence, they cut randomly all over the place. They just make a mess of the DNA after they've done their initial binding. The type 2 enzymes bind very specifically and cut very specifically. And this is what made them so useful for genetic engineering. The type 3 enzymes, while they recognize specifically, they cut away from the recognition sequence, typically 20, 25 bases away from the recognition sequence. And the problem with them, one of the reasons that it's been difficult to work with them, is that they usually will only cut a fraction of the sequences that they recognize. And you really have to purify them and work very hard with them to find conditions where they will actually make complete cleavage. So let's say they have a recognition sequence, CAA, CC. They will bind all of those sequences, but only about half of them will end up getting cut, typically. But if you work hard and play with the buffer conditions and so on, you can eventually, usually get them to cut completely. They will methylate everything, though, and so that's nice. These are the three kinds of modification that we know about in DNA, um, in bacterial DNA, or at least I should say these are the three common ones. So at the top is 5-methyl-C, uh, is um, N4-methyl-C, rather. So this is where an external amino group is methylated. In the middle is 5-methyl-C, and at the bottom is 6-methyl-A. So two different ways in which cytosine residues can be modified, one way in which adenine residues are modified. And these are the ones that we know about from restriction modification systems, but also from a large amount of other work that has taken place too. This is just an advertisement from my database. I run a, a database called Rebase, um, which has, I hope, everything you ever wanted to know about restriction enzymes in it. Now, I want to show you a graph showing you what has happened just in the last year or two. And that is that the number of DNA methyltransferases 
that we've been able to characterize has shot up dramatically. If you look at this chart, you can see that in 2012, going forward, there is a tremendous increase in the number of methyl transferases that's been characterized. The first one was characterized in 1970. And for the first 30, 35 years, there were very few that were characterized. And the reason is that it was very difficult to characterize them. It's not that easy to actually do the biochemical experiments to know what sequence they're recognizing. All of a sudden, it's become trivial to do that. And that's a result of this new sequencing technology that I'm going to tell you about. And it's a sequencing technology by Pacific Biosciences. This is the essence of the method. It's a single molecule method. You take a single molecule of DNA, you can separate the two strands, and then you can use a polymerase to copy one of those strands. And you can see what goes on down here is that as you add the bases, the physics of all of this is such that you can tell how long it takes to copy one base after the other. So A, T, C, and G, fairly regular in the way in which incorporation takes place. But if they're copying a modified base, there is usually a lag. So if the template is, say, methyl C or methyl A, there is usually a lag while the polymerase gets into position and really gets itself ready to add that next base. And one can measure that time, and you can then interpret the difference in time in terms of the modification that's present. And it, this is a very nice technique. It, it's extremely easy to do. Uh, basically, a machine does it for you, and a computer program interprets all of the results. But as a result of this, it means that if I'm going to take a new piece of DNA that is modified, I run it through the machine, and I find out where all the methylated bases are. Now, let us say we take a, a molecule that we're going to sequence that only has one kind of methylation in it. Because I've taken a pure methyl transferase gene, I've cloned it into a plasmid, I put it into an E. coli strain that has no other methylation because genetically we removed all the other methylation. And now all of the methylation you see is due to this one methyl transferase that is on the plasmid. And we use this as a way of showing that the method worked really well. And so here we started off with two cloned methyl transferase genes. One that we knew recognized GTAC and methylated the A residue, and the other one that recognized GTAC also, but it modified the cytosine residue. And what you can see here is I'm measuring the time that it takes to incorporate the next base, and you get a nice signal here because this C is modified, and up here you get a nice signal because the A is modified. And you can see the results are very clear cut. They're very straightforward, very easy to interpret. This was just done as a test because we already knew the answer. We knew which bases were modified. We just wanted to show that the technique would work well. So then we tried some cases where we knew the recognition sequence. We knew what the methyl A's recognized, but we didn't know which base was modified. And you can see in the top example, it's one of the A bases that is modified. In fact, it's the one in the middle. You get a very clear signal from it. And at the bottom, it turns out it's also the A base that is recognized. But it could equally have been one of the C residues. We just didn't know ahead of time. And so that was, again, a nice proof of principle that you could, in fact, interpret this data and get methylation recognition patterns. Now, the ones that I've shown you so far are type 2 systems. These are the ones that are useful for genetic engineering, two separate genes. But in the case of the type 1 and the type 3 methylases, they're a little more complicated. And these are the ones 
that were really difficult to figure out what the recognition sequences were ahead of time. Just a reminder, the type 1 systems have these three subunits. In order to methylate DNA, you need the M and the S gene, the blue and the yellow genes. You just put these two genes in and you get methylation. At the bottom, the type 3 systems have a restriction enzyme gene, a methylase gene, and it turns out that the methylase gene contains the specificity determinant. So again, in order to methylate DNA, here all you need is the methylase gene. If you want to also restrict it, if you want to cut it up, then you have to have a combination of the restriction gene and the methylase gene in order to do that. So two genes for the type 1 systems are necessary to methylate, one gene for the type 3 systems. And so again, we can do the same kinds of experiments. We can clone these genes into a plasmid, put it into a strain of E. coli that is doing no other methylation, and look and see what's going on. This is an example of what you get with a type 1 enzyme with echo K1, where we again already knew the answer, but again, we got a very clear signal um, as shown there. At the bottom, because there are only a few sites, this is a sequence logo, sort of looking around the methylated sites, and you can see that you see this AAC surrounds the methyl base here, and on the other strand, GTGC is the methylated base. And because there are just a few examples, you see not a nice clean motif as you would if you looked at hundreds of sites, but it's good enough. We can tell that you're getting the right answer here. Because what we're really interested in is not cloning genes and doing plasmids. We want to look at whole genomes and get everything all at once. These were the type 3 enzymes. So this is one. We knew it was a type 3 enzyme. We had no idea what the recognition sequence was. And it turns out it's CGAAG. And this is from a Bacillus cereus strain. Now, having convinced ourselves that the technique gave us good data, and that we could, in fact, interpret everything, we decided the time had come to actually look at complete bacterial genomes. Not instead of looking at just a plasmid with a few thousand base pairs, we wanted to look at bacterial genome that had several million base pairs in it, and so many, many sites. Now, because we can do bioinformatic analysis to identify potential methylase genes, we could pick some genomes that were relatively simple to do, things that didn't have a lot of methylases in them. And one of the ones we chose was this organism, Chromohalobacter selexigens. If you look at the system up at the top, you can see it's got the three genes characteristic of a type 1 restriction system. And so we expect to see a result typical of a type 1 restriction system. And at the bottom, there are two genes that look as though they're type 2 restriction modification systems. And so here we expect to see two. So we expect to see three different motifs that contain the methylated bases. And in fact, when you look at it, you see that. In fact, you only see two. And the reason you only see two is because one of the two type, system, two, type two systems that were at the bottom of the circle, only one of them is active. The other one is a dead gene. We actually cloned it out, looked at it, and showed that it was dead. When you look at the motifs, so this is the double-stranded motif here, R, G, A, T, C, Y. R just means that it can be either a pure, it can be either purine at that position, either A or G. Y means it can be C or T. And then you have one of these nice split motifs down here, which is absolutely typical of the type 1 systems. All of the type 1 systems recognize funny sequences in which they have two or three bases, then any base for maybe five, six, seven bases, and then another specific region of three or four bases on the right. And this absolutely conforms to that and is the type 1 system. So just looking here, we were able to find two motifs, but we couldn't match which of the type 2 genes this was responsible for. And so in this case, we had to clone them both out, put them into a plasmid, and do the experiment I told you about at the, at the start to determine which system re recognized what. 
We also did some more genomes at the, se at the same time, some more simple ones. And we did a total of six, shown here. On the right-hand side, I show you the predictions, what we expected, the number of type 1, type 2, type 3 systems. Don't propose to go through all of the results. But what happened, there were a total of 27 methyltransferases that were present in these genomes. And of these, 15 of them turned out to be new specificities. That is, they recognized new sequences that had never been seen before. So you can see, just from this very simple experiment, already we're getting a lot of new data, a lot of new stuff that we previously had no idea about. And so that's always nice. It's always nice to get a lot of new data because then you have to start to think what it means, what's it useful for, how can you use it in some way. <clears throat> Another thing we did um, at the same time as that was to look at a strain of E. coli, uh, which we call strain G, because this is the strain that was responsible for this nasty outbreak of enteritis two years ago here in Europe. Um, this was the strain that came out from Germany. I think it was in spinach or bean sprouts or something, and just caused a large number of deaths. It, it was a, a very bad strain of E. coli. And our friends at Pacific Biosciences, with whom we'd been collaborating on these earlier experiments, and they had sequenced that strain, and they had all of the methylation data. Now, the methylation data for that strain turned out to be quite complicated, and what we did was to clone out each of the methylase genes and look at it individually in our plasmid system in order to deconvolute the methylome, as we call it. The, the methylome is the way we refer to the complete methylation pattern of a genome. What we found here turned out to be quite interesting. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail. I just want to tell you that the very first two methylases we found there were something very new. We'd never seen anything like them before. And what they do is they methylate every A residue. So if you look in a typical plasmid, maybe it's got a couple of thousand A residues in it. Every single one of them is methylated by this methylase. And that is unusual. It's unexpected. And we had to ask, why? What is going on? Well, when we looked at where these methylases occurred in the genome, it turned out that they occurred in a region that is what we call a prophage. It's something where a bacteriophage has, had infected the E. coli and had then integrated its own DNA into the E. coli genome, where it just sat waiting for the right opportunity to pop out and initiate a new infection. These are called prophages. And what typically happens in prophages is that all of the genes, except for one or two, get cut off, get shut off. There are a couple of genes that are left on, and those are the ones that are monitoring the cell to work out when it would be good for the prophage to pop out of the genome and then start replicating and become a phage again. This gene, these methylase genes, these are turned off in this E. coli because they're in the prophage. And our guess is that what happens is that when the prophage excises, when it comes out of the genome and gets ready to start another infection, the first thing it does is to methylate the genome of the phage. And in this way, when the phage is ready to infect another cell, all of its A residues are modified, and so they protect this phage against the action of the restriction enzyme in the new cell. So they're sort of vaccinating themselves, if you will, against the possibility that they're going to try and infect a cell with a restriction enzyme that would otherwise cut them up. And it's actually quite a smart strategy if you think about it. When we look in the databases to see whether there are other examples of this, we find rather a large number. We found several hundred of these genes, and in every case where we've looked, they're in prophages. So here you've got a defense mechanism that the phage came up with. There's one other interesting 
Uh, most of the others are pretty straightforward, um, just normal restriction systems, nothing special. But here was another one, Echo G9, that is on a plasmid, and it has the interesting property that it just methylates one strand of the plasmid DNA. Doesn't do both, just does one strand. And that is unexpected, it had not been seen before. <coughs> this is Echo G1, which methylates everything. And this is the single strand enzyme. And you can see when you look around at this circus plot, you can see all the places where it's methylating but it's only on one strand. We had another example that we found in a, a, a different organism, a Burkholderia species, and it too had this property of just methylating one strand. Now, why, why would you do that? What, what would be the point of this? Why, how, how can this be helpful? Well, in fact, our current hypothesis is that what's going on here is that the methylation is not important. What's important is the fact that when these methylases interact with DNA and flip a base out, this actually destabilizes the helix a little bit and could be the entry point for unwinding the helix. And so maybe what's happening here is that this plasmid has recruited this methyltransferase to serve as a helicase to open up the plasmid DNA and permit replication. Now, if you do it that way, instead of using a regular helicase to do it, what would happen is that you would actually slow down replication because helicases typically go very quickly, whereas methyltransferases operate much more slowly. That would be a big advantage to a plasmid because if you replicate the plasmid too much and make many, many copies, you get a lot of recombination taking place and you can end up with tangles of DNA that might not make it very efficient to have good single-stranded, good um, single copies of the plasmid to transfer to progeny. Now, it's only a hypothesis. We're working on this to do the biochemistry and see if this holds up, but it would give another twist to the whole methylase story that maybe they're also involved in DNA replication in some way, and that would be interesting. Now, we've done a tremendous amount of work, both ourselves and in collaboration with other laboratories, and notably um, the JGI. JGI is the Joint Genome Institute, and it's a part of the Department of Energy. It's located in, out in California, and they've had a Pacific Biosciences sequencing machine for many, many years, and they have been, actually I say many years, two years, because that's only how long they've been out, they've been looking at genomes and doing methylation analysis, uh, but all they were doing was really finding where the methyl groups were, and they contacted me and asked if we would be interested in collaborating to try to match up the genes with the methylation patterns. And so they've now sent me more than 100 complete genomes worth of data, and we're going through that data at the moment, and as you might imagine, there is a lot of very interesting new stuff coming along. So I apologize, this um, table is not showing up quite the way it should, uh, but basically if you look at the candidate methyl, methylase genes that are present in the genome, in these 103 genomes for which we have data here, 119 type 1 systems, 500, more than 500 type 2s, 70 type 3s. Coming on down, the number of the motifs that we can find, that the, the top um, ones are just the candidate genes in the genome, but the number of methylation motifs that we can match to genes, so 48 type 1s, we, we can match to the gene, and so we know what, gene, what that methylase is recognizing, 187 type 2, 30 type 3. The next one shows the number of methylase, mot methylated motifs still to be um, described, still to be assigned. So that's 56, 62, and 13. 36 novel type 1 recognition sequences. We don't know what gene does it. And typically, we can't make the match because there are two candidates. You look in the genome, you see, oh, there are two type 1 systems. You only see one motif, 
or you see two motifs, but you don't know which does which yet. But you can easily imagine that as we are able to assign more and more and more, so we will be able to solve this just as you would a simple puzzle by looking to see what looks like what. And in fact, we're already getting to a point where we can begin to do some of that. If we look at the number of novel recognition specificities, quite a lot, and then a fair number that are already known. So just by doing this analysis, I should say we're now, I have almost 200 genomes worth of data, thanks to people sending me their stuff and, and doing it. We're just getting more and more into this whole field at the present time. So what have we learned so far from all of this analysis? Well, the first thing that, that may seem trivial but is not is that in the case of the type 2 systems, we have a restriction enzyme that recognizes a specific sequence. We have a methylase that recognizes a specific sequence. Now, because the methylase protects, it has to recognize all of the sites that the restriction enzyme recognizes. But it could do that in many ways. It could do it by just recognizing a tiny subset of all the sites. Let's say I've got an, a restriction enzyme that recognizes AATT. Well, the methylase could recognize AATT, or it could recognize all the A residues and methylate every single A residue. Both would be a protective situation. We now know, which we didn't know before, that for all of the type 2 systems for which we have data, there is an exact match between the restriction enzyme, the sequence it recognizes, and the sequence recognized by the methylase. If you think about this in evolutionary terms, there really is no good explanation as why this would have been selected. And so we're still looking around to try to work out why this might be the case, what sort of selective pressures have permitted this to happen. So that was an interesting finding and not one we could have found very easily by any other method. We also know that if we take a methylase gene, put it in a plasmid, where you have multiple copies of the plasmid, a strong promoter so that you make a large amount of the methyl transferase, that they typically show a relaxed specificity. That is, they methylate more than just their normal target sequence. Again, not an unexpected finding. You can imagine you've got a methylase, finds all that its normal sites are modified, and so now it goes and has non-specific binding to various other sites and occasionally will methylate a different site. We also get some nice data out of the Pacific Biosciences machine, which tells you exactly what fraction of the sites are methylated. So when you're looking at, say, GATC, you can ask, is it all the GATCs, or is it 50%, is it 20%? What percentage get methylated? Well, we now know that Every time you have an active restriction enzyme gene around, you get 100% methylation, which you expect. If you didn't get it, the cell would die because its, its restriction enzyme would find the unmethylated sites. And so that means that when you get less than 100% methylation, the restriction enzyme gene cannot be active. Either it's not there or it's dead. And so that's a useful piece of biological information to have. One of the most surprising things is that we found much more variability in the recognition sequences than we ever expected. Um, we, we kind of, if you'd asked me two years ago, what kind of variability is there, I would have said, well, we pretty much know what that is because we looked at so many of these systems previously. It's not true. It, it, we, we had no idea of just how much variability there is. The next thing is that prior to this work, every known type 1 and type 3 enzyme used N6 methyl A in order to protect. We now know of many cases that use N4 methyl C. They have a different way of protecting. That's interesting. One of the more disturbing facts is that we've discovered that the S and M subunits from, say, one system can actually swap 
with MS subunits for another system. And so this means it's going to actually make it quite difficult to work out what is interacting with what inside the cell if you have more than one type 1 system. And we know of some organisms that have as many as five or six type 1 systems in them. And we don't know exactly what is interacting with what. We also know that the S subunits, these specificity subunits, can also interchange with one another and combine with one another to produce strange recognition sequences. And that too is something that we don't yet have a good handle on from the bioinformatics standpoint, but something we need to explain. Finally, at the bottom, just these new methyltransferases, the new amethyltransferases that are single-strand specific. We think these are going to be very useful to us as a company. So everything I've told you so far is all basic research. Um, I, I, I don't think I've come across anything that I don't view as basic research. But the nice thing is when you do basic research in a company, you're always thinking, is, is there a possible product that's going to come out of this? Well, these A-methyltransferases that do all the A residues, these would be ideal if I could put this methyltransferase in the hands of researchers, then any time they're working with organisms that have restriction systems in them, which is pretty much every organism that researchers work with, if you want to protect the DNA against the action of that restriction enzyme, you just methylate it in DNA before you pop it into the new organism. And so this should be a very nice product for us, but there's a problem turns out that if you express this gene at high level in E. coli, what happens is it methylates everything and turns all the promoters off, and so E. coli dies. And so we can't make it. We don't know how to make it yet. We have some ideas of how to make it, but we've not yet made it in anything other than relatively small amounts so far. But we will figure it out. I also want to put in a little plug here for this method of sequencing. So this machine, this PacBio machine, is really a very vast improvement on other sequencing techniques. You've probably heard of Illumina and Ion Torrent and other next, so-called next generation sequencing machines that generate huge amounts of data, enormous amounts of data. And for some purposes, that can be very useful, um, however, PacBio has a different set of advantages that makes it especially useful. First thing is, from my point of view, methylase recognition sequences are easily determined, and since I love those, um, I'm very happy about that. This also means that to provide functional annotation for methylase genes also becomes very easy. You may know that one of the big problems that faces biology at the moment is that we can do all this sequencing and we can find all these genes, but what do they do? Well, for the most part, we don't know. If I typically will sequence a new bacterium, maybe 30, 40 percent of the genes, I will have, maybe 50, I will have no idea what they do. We just don't know. We can see the gene, we can see the protein, we can see it's present in large numbers of bacteria, but we don't know what the protein that is made by that gene, what it does in the cell. And this is critical. We're, we're in bad shape with humans. Most human genes, we don't know what they do. So this means that if you want to actually understand how an organism works, let's say I just want to understand how a bacterium works, we have to work out what is the function of these genes. And we're not spending very much money in trying to learn how to do that perfect project for the EU to get involved in. It's nice because it doesn't cost a lot of money. You're going to find new things all the time. It's going to keep a lot of biochemists employed who otherwise are finding it difficult to make a living in, in departments. And it's going to contribute to global knowledge in ways that we can't even begin to comprehend at the moment. And the nice thing is, if you don't know what a gene product does, when you do figure out what it does, maybe it does something really interesting that will be the start of a new industry, right? You don't know. I can't tell you. I don't know what goes on. And that's why we have to keep doing basic research, you know? The idea that some politician in Brussels 
can tell us what is worth funding and doing is nonsense. They haven't got a clue. They don't even recognize global warming. What hope is there that they're going to go on and tell us about the genes and what they're doing? So this is one of the reasons that I, I love basic research, because you just never know what you're going to discover. And so this is nice. It, it allows us to do some annotation, which previously we couldn't do. And we don't have to do any biochemistry most of the time. It, it just comes out. The other thing is that when you do a sequence of, say, a bacterium, one of the things you want to know is what are all the genes that are there? Well, if you look in GenBank and the databases, you'll discover that there are a number of genomes where we have complete closure. We, we know the full circular content of the genome. But there are many, many more, maybe two, three times as many, where we have shotgun data. That is, we have a lot of little individual bits and pieces, but they can't be put together because some pieces are missing. And these are worse than useless, in my view. I don't know why people even think this is a good thing to do, because as soon as you haven't finished, the gene you might be especially interested in or might be really important for this organism, maybe it's not in the sequence that you've got. Whereas if I've got a complete genome, I know that every gene necessary to make this organism is sitting right there. And the challenge comes to understand it all. So this makes closing genomes very, very easy. And why? It does it because when it produces a piece of sequence, it will produce a piece of sequence that can be up to 10,000 base pairs long. It gives very, very long reads, whereas all of the other high-throughput methods give very short reads. And you can imagine if you've got a fragment, tiny fragments that you're trying to put together, it's like doing a, a jigsaw with 10,000 pieces instead of 100. Okay? A jigsaw with 100 pieces, you know, you put together very easily. 10,000 pieces, ah, oh, forget it, it's going to take you forever. And so that's the, the depth of the problem here, and this solves it. For bacterial genomes, all you very often need is the packed bio data, and you can close the genome. Also, the accuracy of sequence is better. And this is, this is something that I find particularly troubling, because when the method was first introduced, and even today, any individual piece of sequence may have a lot of errors in it. But because what you do is you typically take 50 or 100 reads for each piece, the errors cancel out, and it turns out the errors are random in this case, whereas in the case of all other next-gen sequencing methods, they're systematic. That is, there are places where the polymerase always makes mistakes, and we don't often know where those are. And so uh, quite a lot of data that has come from these other methods actually needs to be reevaluated using a more accurate method. And you can imagine if you're trying to locate a mutation in a disease gene and you want to find out, you know, where is the mutation? What, what is the normal type? What is the mutant? You have to be sure that you've done the sequence properly. And in fact, we know that there are quite a lot of mutational studies that have been done that are out there that are incorrect because the sequencing method made mistakes. So PacBio is much more accurate than these other two. And finally, just a, an interesting puzzle, um, because I love puzzles. Okay? I, I always carry a Sudoku around with me. I just love puzzles. Well, imagine that you're trying to sequence a collection of bacterial genomes. So I've gone into someone's gut, and I've pulled out all the bacteria that are living there, and I sequence a whole lot all at once. Well, it would be very nice if you could be sure of putting together complete genomes for each of the organisms that is there. Now imagine the situation that one of these genomes has a nice collection of methyltransferases on it, that are methylating, say, five, ten different sites around the genome. That means that every piece of DNA that belongs to that organism is going to carry this discrete methylation pattern. That is, we have something over here which is directing the sequence, the methylation sequence around the rest of the genome. And we should be able to use that information in order to separate out 
individual genomes from this collection, this vast collection of metagenomes. No one has done that yet, but it, it clearly should be possible. It, it's just a, a puzzle to be solved, and I think it's a very nice one. It, it, it's one that will end up being rather useful. How am I doing on time? Yeah, a little bit? Okay. <coughs> just remind you what type 1 and type 3 systems are. What I want to do is just to talk to you about another interesting puzzle, a nice bioinformatics puzzle, that relates to these type 1 recognition sequences. Now, I've put up here a few type 1 recognition sequences. So, and I've marked in red the bases that are modified, where a T is modified, um, it is labeled red rather, it means the A that is opposite is actually the base that's modified. And you can see that a typical specificity subunit has two domains. One recognizes the left-hand half of the recognition sequence, the other recognizes the right-hand half. But we don't know which does which. Um, and there, there's no, no well-known pattern so far that we've come across. And so there's a lot of variation. We even have some specificity subunits that have three of these TRDs in them, and that means that typically they can recognize more than one recognition sequence, two, three, four recognition sequences. We also know that there are some specificity subunits that are short and only have one TRD. And in that case, we think that it will interact either with a regular specificity subunit or perhaps with another one that has just one TRD. We don't know. So here you can see some of the variation we see. The number of TRDs can be one, two, or three. We've not found any so far with more than that. The TRD its sequence itself, what it recognizes, can be two, three, four, or five bases. And so there's a lot of variation there. The submotif sequence, okay, so all of the ones that I've put down here are fairly straightforward. They just have A or C or G or T in them. But we know that there are some that have R in them, which means that at a given position, it can be A or G. At another position, a Y, C or T. So we have some variation here also. Um, H means not G. So it can have any base at that position, but it can't have G. So there's some variation, and, and we expect to find more. I, we're pretty certain there's going to be more. And finally, the separation of these motifs can be four or eight. So I think you can see there's tremendous variation possible here, massive amounts of variation. But in fact, what is recognizing these individual groups here on either side, um, there's not that much variation there. And we think we should be able to work out what are the rules. You know, can we figure out what protein sequence recognizes what subunit, um, which half of the sequence, and we're already making some progress. So you can imagine a case where you have two type 1 systems from different organisms, and they share a motif in common. So maybe we have one that recognizes GCGA here, TTTY here, but we have another one that recognizes GCGA here and AACT over here, for instance. When you look at those two, you would expect that the TRD that is recognizing GCGA will be common in both of these. And we should be able, just by looking at the protein sequences, to see what is the protein sequence that's doing the recognition. And I think it's clear that as we get more and more of these things, our ability to make these predictions will be better and better. And of course, ultimately, we would like to be able to design new ones. We'd like to be able to say, oh, I would like a sequence, uh, a TRD rather, to recognize this. We will design it. We will do it synthetically. And I think all of that is going to be possible. So that's, um, let me see, maybe there's another slide here. Yeah, let, let's not worry about that too much, okay? Before I pass on to the acknowledgments, I just wanted to say that what's happened is that just in the last year, year and a half, this technology has burst onto the scene that has opened a door into life in bacteria that we've never had open before. We've never been able to do these kinds of experiments before. 
One of the things we found is that there are a lot of methyl transferases that don't have a partner. They're not part of a restriction system. They're just there. In some cases, they only recognize maybe 50% of their sites that get modified. In other cases, 80% of the sites, but not 100%. In some cases, solitary methylases that do 100%. What are they doing? Well, my guess is that these things are doing epigenetics in bacteria and archaea, and we just don't know what is the biology that accompanies all of this. And so I think we're on the brink of discovering epigenetic phenomena in bacteria that will be at least as interesting as the epigenetic phenomena that we find in humans and in higher organisms. And I think the take-home message is that every time you come across a new technology and you apply it in some different area, you begin to discover stuff. And you begin to make basic discoveries that will open up the door to all sorts of things. And that's why we have to keep doing basic research. If, if we don't do this, all we're going to discover is how to make A or B or C or D, and we will miss out on all of the new phenomena that are out there that ultimately clever commercial companies will be able to capitalize on and make new industries and make money. But if we don't provide the basic building blocks, and typically the companies are not going to do it, it is not in their interest to support this, this is something the government has to do. If, if they don't do it, it is like shutting the door on innovation. And instead of you doing it, the Chinese will do it for you. So I thank you all for listening. These are all the people who've been helpful in my studies. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, either here or later. Thank you.